Good morning, Cathedral of Faith. Good morning, everybody. It's time to worship the Lord. Can we all stand to our feet? Somebody shout, hallelujah. God is good. And all the time, we'd like to take this time to welcome you to your Father's house. And we are going to worship the Lord today. And we just want to invite you to feel comfortable and to enjoy the presence of the Lord and to join in with our worship and praise and an amazing service today. If you feel comfortable to do so, we just extend you, invite you to extend your hands heavenward as we call upon the name of the Lord. Father, thank you for a brand new week. Thank you for a brand new day. We believe that you are good and that your mercy endureth forever and ever. And we pray, Lord, that you would be exalted in the midst of our gathering. We pray that the name of the Lord would be lifted high. And we pray that each and every one of us would be invited to take a deeper walk with you today. I pray, Lord God, that you would bless everything that's said and done in this moment. And may we be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And all of God's people shouted, amen and amen. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Come on, put your hands together with us. Somebody shout, hallelujah. Whoa, come on, here we go. We will not be moved. Jesus, you are here. Come on, everybody. Carrying our burdens, covering our shame. He has overcome us. He has overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved.
shout it out. Thank you, Father. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Yeah. Oh, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. So when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh my God, we'll never fail. Do you believe that? Yeah. So my God, we'll never fail. Say, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yeah, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, 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 yeah. We thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah. Let's all sing it together. There's power. Yeah, there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, every war he wages, he wears. Cause I know how this story ends yeah. Oh, and I know how this story ends We say, come on, say I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory hey, For the battle Say I'm gonna see it yeah, I'm gonna see a victory this come on yes let's declare this truth over our lives hey you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good yeah you turn it for good i don't know about you i'm grateful hey come on say you take what the enemy meant for evil hey you turn it for good yeah you turn it for good to so you take you take with the enemy
Jesus for victory. Whew, thank you, Lord. Cathedral of Faith, God is good. <laughs> In this moment, as we come to the table of communion, I'm so grateful, and I know that you are as well, that the battle belongs to the Lord. And it began with victory, and it ends with victory. And as we hold this bread in our hands, we're reminded the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it. He said, this is my body given for you. Every time that you partake of my body, do this in remembrance of me. And today, let us remember what this represents, that we have the victory, and the battle has already been won. Let us partake together of the body of Christ. And after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks. He blessed it. He gave it to them. And he says, this is the cup of my blood in the New Testament for you. Yeah. As often as you drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Remember my victory at Calvary. Remember how I triumphed over the last enemy, death, and rose again triumphantly, victoriously for you. Remember that I have given you the victory, and now you go forth as my disciples, sharing this victorious message, this gospel of grace, until I come again. Let's drink together. Jesus gathered his disciples and he taught them a prayer and he says, this is the most important prayer that you will pray because I'm teaching it to you. Let's read it together, the Lord's prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever somebody shout victory, victory. come on victory victory, victory. one shout of hell God bless you as you see it.
Hello, Cathedral friends and family. Whether you're on campus or online, it's so good to be together this week. We got some exciting things coming up, and here's what's happening. First, if you're new around here, welcome. We're so glad you're here, and we would love to get to know you better, as well as share with you a little bit about our church community. So we encourage you to take out the card in the seat back in front of you, scan the QR code, and it will take you to a page where you can get connected, give, and find out more information about the church and how to get involved. We can't wait to get to know you better. Come and stand for your family's breakthrough and all that get hot. Pull it up. Let's do that again. Okay. That is a tongue tire. Come and stand for your family's breakthrough and all that God has for it. At our centerpiece marriage and family prayer breakfast, July 15th. Let's worship and pray for God to work in and through them all as family. Get ready for a wholesome breakfast and a time to be made whole. Space is limited, so sign up now. Visit our kiosk in the lobby after service. But that's not all. If you're ready to take another step towards the marriage that God has intended for you, Ignite Silicon Valley Marriage Conference is coming September 22nd and 23rd. We believe this event can transform your marriage and position you for a future of relationship success. Be inspired by guests like Gary Chapman. Sign up at our kiosk in the lobby after service. Learn why and how to create and multiply financial resources for Kingdom Impact this fall at this exciting event. Life Search will be happening Saturday, September 9th here at Cathedral. Gather with thousands of Christians for a life-changing moment. Featured guest speakers include Tim Tebow and Nick Vujicic. Well, that's it for this week. But for more information, please check out our website, follow us on social media, and download our app for the latest and greatest of what's happening at Cathedral. See you guys. Well, good morning, Cathedral family. What a great joy to be together here, worshiping the Lord and enjoying each other. You know, we've been praying and planning and preparing all week for this moment so that you could have an encounter, be encouraged and strengthened and experience the presence of the living God. We've been praying for God to work in you today. And one of the foundational prayers here at Cathedral of Faith is this, Lord, help us see the needs no one else is seeing. Help us care about those no one else is caring for and help us to... to What's the third one? <laughs> See the needs, hear the cries, and care about those no one else is caring about. That's what guides everything we do here each week as we minister and as we serve and taking care of our community and loving our community. You know, one of the things that people often study is what is somebody's last words? Because sometimes the words they speak that are last recorded far outlive that person. And one of the great statements in the book of Acts are the last words of the Apostle Paul. And this is what's recorded in Acts chapter 20 when he's leaving the Ephesian elders. He says, don't only preach, help the poor. Don't only preach, help the poor. That's the final words of Paul, and I believe that that's not just a desire for us, that's a call to action. And each week, because of your faithfulness, because of your generosity, we're able to make a difference in this community. You know, this past week, there was a single mom with three kids who had enough food because of your generosity. Amen. There was a homeless couple who all of a sudden had possibilities and provision and hope because of your generosity. There was a, a young man who came out of jail this week who found a job and had direction because of your generosity. There was a young teen this week who decided to end her life but fortunately was saved and because of your giving, people were able to minister to her here through Cathedral of Faith. Through your giving, there's children who lost their parents. There's children who lost their parents who now have a place to live, food to eat, and an education because of your generosity. There were girls that were rescued this week from human trafficking because of your generosity. That's what you're able to do. I love this passage of scripture in Proverbs chapter 14 where we read this. When we are generous to the poor, we honor him. We honor God. In other words, when we show love for the poor, we're actually showing our love for Christ. In fact, our love for Christ is reflected in those kind of moments because when we've done it to the least of these, we've done it to him. So 
because of your generosity, thousands of people had needs met this week. And we ask you to continue the opportunity for that to happen in the days and weeks to come by you being generous today as well. And there are many ways that you can give. You can go online, you can go to the app, our church app, you can text the number on the screen. For those of you watching from home and online, you can write out a check and mail it to us at Drop It By. You can be part of making a difference and fulfilling those words of Paul. Don't just preach, but care for the poor. Cathedral of Faith has four core values. It's a place where everybody's welcome. It's a place where nobody's perfect. It's a place where the love is lived out and it's a place where anything is. Well, I'm gonna invite you to stand with me as we declare the power of God with whom nothing's impossible. As the worship team comes to lead us, let's just acknowledge that and receive that truth today.
Victory. Say that with me. Victory's in the air today. Oh, Cathedral family, God is good. And all the time. I am so glad that you're here with us, whether you're on site, in the building, outside in the amphitheater, the coffee shop, out in the drive-in, or those watching online. We love our online community and other campuses around the Bay. God has been so good to Cathedral of Faith, and one of the ways he's been so good to us and so good to me as a pastor is to bring amazing people into my life and into the life of our church. And today, we have one of these amazing people with us. It's his first time ever to speak here at the Cathedral of Faith. Um, John Ortberg is one of the finest teachers in the nation today. He's a best-selling author. <laughs> has led some of the most influential churches around the country. He has a devotional that he does five days a week that's on something called Become New. You can sign up for it. I would encourage you. I listen to that virtually every day to start my day. It's an amazing way to start your day with God, listening to John's devotional. And over the last few years, we've become very dear friends. And his wife, Nancy, has been with us and spoken, but it's his first time here with us. So I hope your heart is ready. We're in a series in the book of Psalms, and he's coming to continue that series. Would you give him a great big welcome to Cathedral of Faith, John Ortberg. <laughs> That is about the warmest welcome I have ever gotten. Now, if you would remain standing for the sermon. No, I'm just kidding. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. Uh, I'm so honored to be here and talk about this amazing Psalm 121. I have been to Cathedral on the campus uh, many times. You very generously sponsor all kinds of events to help churches and pastors around the Bay Area. But this is my first time here for Sunday morning worship. And this was fabulous. Thank you, team. Is it like this every week? Wow. Um, and I, I want to tell you, I am a big fan of this church. I love how you feed people who are hungry, what Dr. Wayne was just talking about, how you care about providing homes for people that don't have a home, how you include every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Uh, Especially your pastor, Ken, is a treasured friend. His kindness and encouragement to me, especially over these last years, has meant more than I can say. I don't think I know of a pastor of a big church who is more humble, more kind, more other-centered, just wants to love other people than this guy right here. So you take very good care of him. Now... I want to talk today uh, to anybody who ever worries or knows somebody who worries or thinks that you might worry at some point in the future. Anybody here in that category? Sometimes worry is even a worse problem in churches because there'll be Christians who worry about life, but then they might hear that if you just have enough faith, you wouldn't worry, so they start to worry that they don't have enough faith. Some people, as you may know, are genetically predisposed to worry. A recent study found that there's a gene, apparently labeled RBFOX1 gene, that may be associated with generalized anxiety disorder. If you now find yourself worrying that you may have this gene, <laughs> then this psalm is for you. It addresses something real deep about the human condition um, there is a kind of aloneness and vulnerability that we never can escape. We are born alone. We die alone. When our first child was born, I had the strangest experience I did not anticipate. Uh, she was just a couple of minutes old, and Nancy handed that little baby to me, and I held her. And it was like all of a sudden in my mind, I could see the whole arc of her life. And I said to Nancy, it's so strange, this little blob that I'm holding right now is going to grow up and then grow old, and this skin that is so perfect and smooth and pink right now is going to get wrinkled and mottled and saggy one day, and 
this hair, Laura is born with one little strip of red hair like a little mohawk. This red hair is going to turn gray, and then it'll turn white, and then she'll become an old lady, and then we'll grow old, and we'll die, and then she'll grow old, and she'll die, this little baby I'm holding right here. Nancy said, let me hold the baby. You're creeping her out. Because <laughs> there, is, there is this condition that we cannot save other people or ourselves from. We are born alone in a very profound way. We live alone and we die alone. And the question is, is there anybody watching over us? Is there anybody taking care of us? And these words, Psalm 121, have spoken to human beings for thousands of years in the fiercest of problems. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is the name you might know, one of the most brilliant thinkers of the 20th century, sacrificed everything to identify with and stand with Jesus against Nazis. And he did it with a poise and a confidence that were remarkable, not because he didn't face any problems, not because he was convinced that his circumstances would be okay. They were not okay. He was hounded and persecuted and imprisoned, eventually killed. It was because he was gripped by the reality that this man, Jesus, who demanded his entire obedience, who in turn gave him meaning and purpose, stood with him in a way that nothing, not even torture or death, could get in the way of. And when Dietrich Bonhoeffer began his ministry, he preached on this text, this Psalm 121. It has become a deeply personal one for me. I say it almost every morning when I pray. So here it is. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day or the moon by night. He will keep you from all harm. The Lord will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. Those are... You know, it's a good thing to celebrate those words, isn't it? And I love them because they're very physical, they're very earthy, a lot of images. It's like the psalmist just wants to get this right down here where we can live with it. And that's what I want to, as best I can, talk with about you for these next moments because what matters is that you come to believe this, not just profess it, not just feel it in a moment in a church service, but that it becomes part of the mental map through which we walk by, that I come to believe that there's somebody watching over me the way that I believe in gravity right now. So it just determines the way that I live. So I want to ask you to think real deeply about these are claims now. This is not an idea about reality, about how things are. God, help me to live in it. The psalmist starts, I lift my eyes. What does that mean? Well, it was a common expression in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament. It, of course, doesn't just refer to my physical eye. It means to notice something, to become aware of reality, of possibilities. It means to find your attention grabbed or arrested. Sometimes it's positive. God comes to Abraham in the book of Genesis and says, Lift up your eyes. All the land that you see, north, south, east, and west, I will give you. The idea is now, Abraham... Let your imagination come back over and over again to the promise, to the hope. That was real positive. Sometimes in the Bible, people do this in a negative way. Later, we're told Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the hill of Mount Moriah where he thought his son Isaac was going to die. And, and that would mean fear and dread. But always, it means that your imagination has been activated, your mind, lift up your eyes. We all do this. There's a wonderful use in Genesis 24 where Rebecca sees her future spouse, Isaac, for the first time. And it says, Rebecca lifted up her eyes and saw Isaac and asked, who is that man, that striking figure of a man? 
How many of you wives here, the first time you saw your husband, lifted up your eyes and said, who is that striking figure of a man? How many of you wives did that? And if you're not raising your hands right now, that's not a wise move because you could be earning brownie points for nothing at all. Anyway, this is a vivid Hebrew way of expressing one of the greatest of human freedoms, which nobody, not, not a boss, not a garden of concentration camp, can take away from you the freedom to decide where you will place your mind, what will occupy your attention. You can do this. Lift up your eyes. I can focus my attention on my problems. I can focus my attention on my worry, on my inadequacy, on my trouble, or I can focus on God. I can do that. And you can too. Whatever's going on in your life, your body, your bank account, your world, your house, your office, your job, your lack of a job, you can do that right now. It's a learned behavior. It is a skill that can be acquired. We need help from God to do it. But anybody can do it. Such a rich phrase. Just that one. I lift up my eyes. Then the psalmist goes on to the hills. What's that about? Now, we tend to think of hills as positive things. A lot of times when people hear this verse, they think that the hills are a source of inspiration. Hills are beautiful to us, especially if you grew up in California. Uh, Californians are very proud of their state's hills. I grew up in Illinois. My wife grew up in California. We have a lot of arguments about our home states. We lived in Illinois for almost a decade, and my wife said when she moved to Illinois, it looked like God took an iron and flattened out the entire state. (laughs) But you know, in the ancient world, if you wanted to travel, and this Psalm 121, as you may know, is a psalm for pilgrims. It's part of what was called the journey of ascent. And in the ancient world, hills were something that got in people's ways when they were traveling. They could be exhausting. You ever have to climb up a steep hill? And this is why Isaiah says, some of you will know this passage from the Old Testament, That when the day of the Lord comes, when God straightens everything out, and it will come, and he will do that, notice the language, every valley will be raised up, and every mountain and hill will be, anybody know? Made low. And the rugged places made a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. In other words, heaven will look flat, just like Illinois. It's in the Bible. And the idea behind this is that in the ancient world, hills were kind of problems. They could be beautiful, but they were also a place where there was danger. Thieves, wild beasts, kidnappers who could not hide on the plain. They could hide in the hills. So now, for the word hills, you might substitute the word circumstances. I see my circumstances. Sometimes they might be beautiful, but a lot of times they're problems. Money problems, job problems, no job problems, family problems, health problems, emotional problems, secret problems, relational problems, justice problems, racial problems. I see them and I think, how am I going to make it over that hill? Everybody here got a hill. Where am I going to find help? And then even before I face that external problem, job, relationship, whatever it is, I have this internal spiritual problem of worry, and it sucks the life out of me. And you look, when you're walking around, there are people who never lift up their eyes. You ever notice that? They just walk like this. I do that sometimes, because worry kills us. It's so interesting. I'm told that the word worry comes from a German word, worgen, which originally meant to strangle or constrict or choke. That's what worry does. For a moment right now, turn to the person next to you. Just real quick, turn to that person. Put your hands on their throat and gently choke them until they turn red. Uh, And then, no, don't actually do that. uh, Then you get a sense of what it is that worry is a physical thing. It is part of the enemy of our lives, spiritually and physically. That's why God who is into life, Jesus, when he came, said, I have come that you might have life and have it with abundance. Jesus never said, worry is God's will for anybody. You read through the whole Bible, it never says, and then God was really worried. Never says that. God never is. 
I lift up my eyes to the hills. I see my circumstances. And no matter how beautiful, there's always some problems there. And I think, where's my help going to come from? My help comes from the Lord. Not the hills, not the circumstances, not this world. My help comes from the Lord. And this is a beautiful, beautiful thought. Uh, the word help is used over 200 times in the Bible, most often, to, most often to describe God. God is our help. God is the help. Now, humanly speaking, to be the help is kind of a humbling thing. You know, they're the help. But God wants to be the help. That's our God. That is the heart of our God. That's part of what the Bible reveals about God that the ancient world did not. Zeus was not the help. Baal was not the help. Thor was not the help. The God of the Bible is our help. Moses named one of his sons Eleazar. El is the word for God. And it means God has helped. My God, my Father's God is my help. So it's a humbling thing for God to say, yep, I'll be the help. But it's also humbling news for me. For self-sufficient people in a culture of performance, where everybody wants to be the smartest, most successful person in the room, because it says, I am the kind of little creature who needs help. That's me. I am helpless. Now, sometimes worry takes the form of anxiety and pain, and a lot of us in here struggle with that. A lot of the people that we love struggle with that. It also takes other forms like workaholism. That can be a form of worry or escapism. Some people try to avoid worry by medicating themselves with alcohol or with achievements or on the internet. I'll lift up my eyes on stuff that I ought not to lift up my eyes on. Very often we deal with worry by going into control mode. And, and reality starts with this recognition. This part of what I lift up my eyes to the heels means I am not in control. I am not in control. Can you all say that? I am not in control. Can anybody here guarantee your body's going to stay healthy? Nope. You can eat right, exercise twice a day, see a doctor once a week, but that clock is ticking. Have you noticed? Have you looked in a mirror lately? <laughs> clock is ticking. Ultimately, your body, not in your hands. Can anybody here control our nation's political well-being? Nope. No human being can. Politicians sometimes want to make people think they can. I can solve all the problems. That's actually called idolatry. No human being has that kind of power. Can you control the economy? Nope. You can work hard. You can try to save money. That's good. Ultimately, the economy is way beyond merely human power. Can you make your spouse change? <laughs> Apparently, there's a little ambiguity about that question. The correct answer would be, no, you cannot make your spouse change. God can change your spouse. That's good news. God can change your spouse's spouse. See, the, my problem is I want to trust in me. I want to trust my strength, my gifts, my will, my education, my social skills, my finances, my network of people. My, but one day I'm going to run into a hill that none of that stuff can conquer. And on that day, you'll want to know. Where do you lift up your eyes? Where's my help come from? The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, real important question. What kind of help comes from God? And now, gang, this gets us real deep into issues of the kingdom and spiritual reality and the nature of God in the future and our lives as persons that he loves. God is about more than uh, anxiety avoidance. Uh, this doesn't mean, uh, this psalm, that I will always get help from God in getting the little projects done that I am so sure I got to get done. This doesn't mean I will get help so that I can experience exactly the kind of circumstances that I know I have to have to be happy. It does not mean that uh, I'll get help from God to assist me in getting ahead because it's so important to God that I get ahead in my little ego-driven agenda. This brings us to one of the most, maybe the most important word in this psalm, which you probably will have noticed. It's repeated over and over. Uh, it's the kind of help that God gives. Watch. Watch. Over and over, psalmist says, 
He watches over you. He watches over Israel. He watches over your life. He will watch over your life. He will watch over your coming. He will watch over your going. That little verb gets used six times in these few verses. You have a watcher. You have a watcher. When we had three kids that were real small, we were staying at a hotel with a pool one time. It's kind of a thrill when you're a little kid. You get to stay at a place with a pool. Nance was watching the baby in the room. So I was with the other two that were about three and five. And it said, now, John, you got to watch them every second because bad things can happen. And so I told both those two kids how important it was not to run around the pool. You could drown. And apparently I warned them a little too effectively because at one point the five-year-old was going to jump to me and the three-year-old slipped into the water. And I immediately reached down and picked her up and pulled her out. But she was sobbing, oh, daddy, I drowned, I drowned, I drowned. <laughs> and I said, no, honey, you didn't drown. I was watching you the whole time. My arms were right there to pull you right out, which I did. You didn't drown, so... Let's not tell mommy about this. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Jesus, Jesus says one time that God is watching over you to such an extent that the one who trusts in me, Jesus says, will never taste death. Like your life, your mind, your thoughts, it's just going to go right on. You will never, that's an amazing statement. You will never if you trust me, Jesus says, taste death because there's a God that's watching over you, watching what's going on in your life, in your body, with your money, in your relationships right now so you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to. The Lord will watch over your coming and going. What, what's that about? Well, it's kind of a technical phrase uh, in Hebrew, I'm told. When you wake up in the morning, you go out into the world. You work, barter, trade, play, whatever you do. And then uh, at night, you come home to rest, to relax, to sleep. And so the Lord will watch over your going out, and he will watch over your coming in. It is simply a way of saying uh, every moment, 24-7, 24-7. And the sun will not harm you by day. Now, again, this psalm is what was called a psalm of ascent. Uh, Israelites would chant it as they were ascending to Jerusalem, which was up one of those hills in kind of a hard climb. When you're traveling by day in the desert, up a steep slope, sun, heat, sunstroke, thirst, that's the great danger. The sun will not harm you by day. Or the moon by night. Oh, that sounds kind of strange. How would the moon strike you? Well, in the ancient world, the moon was often associated with um, mental Im impairment or uh, emotional struggles. Uh, in the New Testament, twice a Greek word is used, moonstruck, in that way. Even in English, we have this kind of connection. Um, you know, lunar has to do with the moon. Lunacy, lunatic, that idea that somehow there's some connection there. <laughs> so the idea here is in your waking and sleeping, in your coming and your going, through your day and through your night, from the sun, what assaults you physically. From the moon, what assaults your mind, your emotional well-being. God the watcher neither slumbers nor sleeps. He is your shade at your right hand. What's that about? Well, in the ancient world, most people are right-handed. The Bible's kind of a right-handed book. Right hand is the hand of action. That's where you're going to engage with the world where you need to be strong. That's where a counselor would be. That's where a bodyguard would be. That's where the one that you need the most would be to signal, I'm not just here, I'm here at your right hand. When you have to make a decision, when it's time to take action. This language is so beautiful. And again, I just you know, invite you after today to live in this psalm for a while and... and to test it and see, is this true? He will not let your foot slip. Now, we have to be real honest about this. One of my favorite books was written about 40 years ago 
by a philosopher named Nicholas Walterstorff. And about 40 years ago, a little more than that now, he had a beloved son, Eric, who died when he was mountain climbing at the age of 21. And Nicholas Walterstorff is both a brilliant Yale philosopher and a very serious follower of Jesus. And he was haunted by that verse. The Bible says God will not let your foot slip, but Eric Falterstorff's foot slipped. And for 40 years, his dad has mourned him. That book, if you've ever suffered, Lament for a Son, is a wonderful, wonderful gift. Cry of lament. Whatever this statement means, it is clearly not a promise of lifelong physical safety. And we have to be honest about this. It does not mean that I will be kept Um, financially well or physically well. Generally in the Old Testament, it's a way of talking about leaving the path of obedience. You may know in the Old Testament, a lot of times it will talk about what's sometimes called the path of the righteous, the path of doing God's will, being on the right way. So to have a foot slip more often than anything else meant to leave that path to sin, to go in the wrong direction. Classic example of this Uh, way that the phrase is used is in Psalm 73 where the psalmist says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Can you imagine envying prosperous people who don't deserve to be prosperous? That would never happen in the Bay Area where we live. (laughs) But in the ancient world, that kind of thing went on. And the psalmist says, when I was in that condition, I almost gave in to an attitude, a life of envy, bitterness, anger, ingratitude. I almost lost my foothold. To say that God will not let your foot slip is not saying God will keep you from all problems, all pain, all trouble, all discomfort, all loss, not at all. It is to say God will help me to stay obedient to him precisely in those problems. God will help keep me from sin if I have a yielded heart. God will... Guard my soul. It is to say uh, that nothing eternal is at risk with God. Now, everything temporal is at risk. My job, my body, the bodies of people I love, money, possessions, everything temporal is at risk. Nothing eternal is at risk. That's why Paul says, what then shall trouble me? Danger, hardship, famine, persecution, sword? No, none of these things can separate me from the love of Christ. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not because our circumstances will turn out, but because God will hold us in the worst of circumstances. Nothing can separate me. We are a part of people, followers of God, of whom untold thousands have sacrificed their lives for the name of Jesus and counted it a privilege. Bonhoeffer, this is amazing. Bonhoeffer wrote, uh, not long before he died, peace is the opposite of security. We want security. What is security? Security is to demand guarantees that will protect us. Peace means giving oneself completely to God, wanting no security but in faith and obedience, resting in the hand of Almighty God. We want security, but we have no peace. God offers peace with no security at all. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Um, when I was young, I, I would lift up my eyes to my father. My dad was strong. My help came from him. We played tennis a lot. When I was born, I had a tennis racket in my crib just to let me know what was coming in life. <laughs> and my dad and I would often play tennis tournaments, father and son tournaments. And when I was little and he was big and strong and fast, you know, he would hit about 80 or 90 percent of the shots. I'd be over on my little side of the court, but he was big and he would go all over. And then over time, uh, strength changes. 
And when my dad turned 70, I took him to New York and we played in the father, uh, super senior father and son national tournament in Long Island on grass courts. And um, it was so poignant to think about how things were now. We did okay until we ended up playing the number one seed in the tournament and they beat us 6-1 in the first set. It was ugly. So we were changing sides and my dad said to me, I want to tell you our strategy for this next set. I thought this would be good. My dad always loved strategy and figuring out how do you change things in order to win. So I thought this would be fun to hear. And my dad said, here's our strategy, Johnny. We're going to turn you loose. I'll be over here returning serves, but I want you to be all over the court, smash overheads, poach net shots, pass them wickedly, hit top spin lobs, be everywhere, be brilliant. I'll be over here cheering you on, but our strategy is we're going to turn you loose. I was very disappointed in this strategy. Because what I knew was I was about as loose as I was going to get. Where does my help come from? The day comes when my strength, turning me loose, isn't going to be enough. The maker of heaven and earth. My dad, about six years ago or so, was diagnosed with a cavernoma, something like a brain tumor uh, in kind of the, the brainstem area of his head, and his health began to decline. And I decided to take him to the Galapagos Island. We were just talking about the Galapagos. Kind of the trip of a lifetime. My dad had wanted to go there his whole life long. Uh, My mom never wanted to go, so I took him there. It was the last month physically he could have gone. By that time, uh, uh, he had a great deal of difficulty walking. His one half of his face was paralyzed. His speech was garbled. When he would eat, food would kind of drool down from his mouth. So it was a difficult trip for him. He, he loved, um, you know, the, there's uh, uh, amazing uh, flora and fauna in the Galapagos, blue-footed boobies and, and Arctic and uh, tropical penguins and, and so. Uh, but we'd have to eat with other people, and I was a little embarrassed for my dad. And before that trip was done, three different people came up to me and said, I just want you to know, Your dad is kind of my hero. And I hope when I'm facing something like what he's facing, I can have the kind of courage that he does. And a couple months later, when he was in a facility because he wasn't mobile anymore, he had one day where he had had a poem framed for a friend and then bought a book for another one and gave it to both of them. And because of his physical condition, what that meant to those people was profound. And my dad said to me, even when I'm dying, I can be flourishing. Now, I, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? That's Dietrich Bonhoeffer on the way to the gallows. That's Nicholas Walterstorff the loss of a beloved son. That's my dad, hardly able to walk or talk. This is not a hallmark psalm. This is not a promise that your life will be cushioned. These are sterner, better words for a steeper and more noble journey. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, for there is another hill many miles away, many years away, and on that hill there is a cross, and on that cross there is a man, and on that man is all my sin and all my hope and all of yours, and the name of that hill is Calvary, and the name of that man is Jesus, and he died so we can live. But the only way to really live, the only way to really live is to die with him first, to die to my sin, the smallness of my selfishness, my fear every day, I have it, of pain and discomfort. It is that to which we are called. 
We are not free from worry because believing in God cushions us from pain. We die with Jesus so that we can live. And that's my prayer for you. And I'm going to ask my friend Ken. Ken, would you come on up and close our time together? Would you stand with me, please? Would you let John know how much you appreciate that powerful, powerful word? John, thank you. Yeah. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. Father, thank you for the word that we've heard today. I pray that we would take hold of it, and even more importantly, that it would take hold of us, and that you would align our body, mind, and spirit with the reality of this truth. And Father, for those today who are facing those kinds of moments, the hill in front of them is, is a difficult one. I pray the confidence of knowing that you are with us and you are for us and you are watching over us would meet us in this moment. We lift up our eyes and fix our eyes on you. We look to you. We put our trust and our confidence in you today. Thank you again, God, for loving us like you do. Thank you for watching over us. We're so grateful for your love and your care. And we bless your name. Forever and forever, your praise will be upon our lips. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's give God praise one more time. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just, again, want to say thank you to our friend, John. Thank you, buddy, for coming and sharing that powerful truth. It's so great to have you with us. You know, if you need further prayer, our team will be down here in front after to pray with you and pray for you. If you've never turned your life over to Christ, every journey starts with a step, and you can take that step today. Come up after service, and we'd love to pray with you so you can begin your journey with Jesus. And then don't forget on your way out, you know, the marriage conference is right around the corner coming up in September. It'll be here before you know it. And so we encourage you, be looking forward to uh, ways that you can continue to grow in your relationship with God and with each other. And next week we continue our series in Psalms and Dr. Wayne has a powerful word he'll be bringing to us. So we're looking forward to that. And I just want you to know, Cathedral family, do you know that you're loved today? Yeah. Amen. Let me speak God's blessing over you as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine brightly upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. And this week, may you walk with an awareness that God is watching over you. And I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen. God bless you as you go, Cathedral. Have an awesome, awesome day.